Okay, so when I was 14, year old, 14 years old, my friends and I, we loved soft drinks, mostly Coke, um, but also Red Bull, Sprite, any kind of energy drink, really. Um, but we had a problem. A can this big cost two euros of my local school canteen, and I was working at KFC at the time and earning five euros an hour, so it wasn't a good equation. And I figured there had to be a better way. So a friend and I, we went to a local supermarket around my place. We tried a few, and eventually we found what seemed to be the solution, which was 24 cans for five euros. Crazy deal, right? Couldn't believe it. Almost too good to be true. So our eyes lit up, and we thought, we can't even drink this many, but what we could do is take it to school, sell them, drink some, make a little money on the side. The plan was made, and we went home that day, took half each, hid them from our parents, and went to school the next day to start our business. Very quickly, we realized we had a problem. We had 24 cans of Dr. Pepper. That's my favorite soft drink. You couldn't buy it at school, so it's exotic. Um, but we sold one can out of 24. No one wanted it, and we'd gone all in on this one flavor. People wanted Coke, obviously. We saw that now. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, is that you need to test your business ideas before you go all in on them. That was our biggest mistake that day. So, oh no. I used the computer. About me, um, I'm a software developer from Sydney, Australia. I just moved to Berlin last year, and I'm working at Bosch as part of their e-bike team. So um, we sell e-bikes, we have an app for it, and my team's the back-end team um, behind some of the services supporting this stuff. Most of our stack is um, AWS, Kotlin, Spring Boot, Kafka, Kubernetes, that kind of stuff. And I love basketball, so if you want to talk about Nikola Jokic, please hit me up, anyone. So why am I here talking about prototyping? I've worked in some teams which had very long and slow feedback loops. We'd have software architects planning tasks two years in advance. Us, the junior developers, would need to estimate these tasks. How many hours is this going to take me in two years? Um, and our clients needed guarantees. It wasn't the team's fault. Our clients wanted to know to the day, when is this going to be done in two years, and how much is it going to cost? And we were working off giant requirements documents, huge Microsoft Word documents with bullet points or Excel spreadsheets with a million links. And testing ideas was extremely slow and expensive. Two years later, our clients saw the products. I've also worked in teams with extremely short feedback loops. They used cust constant customer engagement, and they built the right thing, and they did it because testing ideas for them was fast and cheap which meant they could afford to test all the time. And they did that by prototyping. So what do I mean prototyping? This is Tom Chi, one of the innovators of rapid prototyping at Google. He worked a lot on Google Glass, you can see. Um, and this is what he says about prototyping. Let's go from the idea to something we can actually see, feel, and touch as quickly as possible, because then all these illusions around why I'm right and you're wrong fall away. We get to the simplicity of, is a thing truly of service or not. He would literally go to the mall. You probably know this mall. He'd take his team there, sit down with a couple engineers in the food court with their laptops. A couple other people would talk to random customers over and over again. They'd test something with them. They'd make changes on the laptop and test again, over and over. They were testing business ideas, and it was cheap and fast. James Dyson had a great idea for a new vacuum cleaner. The air would spin up like a cyclone. You wouldn't need a bag. Um, it would be a bit quieter. It took him 5,126 prototypes to get there, but he made it. James Dyson, the Dyson company, worth $8 billion. So he used prototypes for testing new technologies. I've also done this in tech. Um, I had a team who wanted to add some geospatial data to some of their services, and we already had Postgres, but um, the Postgres features we wanted weren't available in our Postgres version, and upgrading was going to be a real pain. So instead of upgrading and then testing, 
if we even wanted this new extension, we used a prototype and found out if the customer really even wanted this. So why rapid prototyping? Does anyone recognize this little guy? That's Luxo Jr. He's the star of Pixar's first ever animated feature film, which was showcasing their brand new technology, which would change film forever. This is Ed Capmull, one of the co-founders um, and pioneers of the technique early on. He was right behind it. Uh, and he really understood that to get this new technology going, he was going to need a test. Here's a couple of his quotes. When costs are low, it's easier to take a risk. Okay? They couldn't have found and developed this new technology without taking constant risks all the time, little by little. Unleashing creativity requires that we loosen the controls and accept risk. So again, loosen the controls, accept risk to innovate. He had a small team called the Brain Trust, which was some higher-ups who would meet with directors of Pixar early on and constantly innovate over their movie ideas. So they'd be um, presenting storyboards or mock-ups constantly to these guys, getting feedback all the time. The Lean Startup, Eric Ries, kind of old by now, over 10 years old, but I still love this quote. The big question of our time is not can it be built, but should it be built? And rapid prototyping answers that question. Should it be built? Because technology is getting to such a level that can it be built is not that important. So these two men, they were a generation apart, completely different industries, but they both understood the same thing. And that's that innovation and business success can't come without the ability to test rapidly. The business needs to be able to take risks to find out if you're even building the right thing. And we can only do so if it's cheap and easy to take a risk. A prototype as a requirement document. This is an idea pioneered by Marty Kagan lately. Um, no multi-page bullet point word documents instead of real working prototype. It's clearer for stakeholders. It's easier to get feedback on. Users love giving feedback on something they can touch and use. On a full document, probably not. There's no room for confusion between developers and requirements, because in this case, your prototype literally is written by the developers. The engineers are part of the early process. This is a key benefit of prototyping early. It's building ownership of the product in the engineers which brings the team together and provides a purpose. Engineers in their team, when they feel like they are part of the business and contributing, are totally different to engineers who feel like they're Jira ticket pushers. But isn't prototyping just for designers and product managers? Yeah, there are a lot of great tools out there, um, but there are different levels of prototypes as well. One doesn't replace the other. Designers still make prototypes. I'm not saying they need to stop. But here we're wanting to maximize the plausibility of the prototype, make it as real as possible, and make sure we're learning how people actually use our service and not how we think they will use it or how they think they will use it. I've already talked about involving the engineers early, feeling the ownership, and by having the engineers there on day one, you find out what's feasible and what's not. A product manager can't tell you if, for example, your app could integrate with the local transport network and give updates to people. They need engineers there. And it's on the engineers to say, yeah, that's easy or no. So how do I prototype? A lot of people like these languages. Python, Go, JavaScript for prototyping, um, partly because some of them can be lightweight or concurrent or just easy to spin something up. But for me, I love Java. That's why I'm here, obviously. I like the static typing, swapping it out with Kotlin, the maturity, great long-term support. The online community and guides are amazing. Testability, especially depending on framework, is great. Um, and it's really perfect for building enterprise services. That's why I'm hooked on the JVM. So this is my proposed prototyping stack that you can try. I feel like I'm walking into the lion's den here, because you're probably not going to like this, and it goes against all the cool Java hotness. Spring, Lambda, Kotlin, and DynamoDB. And I'm not talking about Spring Cloud Functions. I'm talking about good old Spring Web application. 
So you're probably thinking Spring Web on Lambda. That's kind of gross. And it does seem that way. Cold starts. I mean, your whole Spring context needs to start up. You've got the class pass scanning. If you're lucky, that's six seconds, maybe. It could be 30 plus. Meanwhile, your user is waiting. It could be a timeout or just a terrible UX. You've got duplication of responsibilities. I mean, Spring already handles all the gateway and routing, and now you're putting all this into Lambda functions instead. The impact on downstream services. You might have a Postgres database connected, which only takes, for example, 60 simultaneous connections. Well, it's Lambda. We don't know how many times people are going to hit this concurrently. You could have 1,000 functions running at once. And lastly, it's Spring. It's not exactly the cool guy on the block. It's opinionated and feels super heavy-handed for Lambda. And there's a lot of auto-config magic, which we're kind of trying to move away from, right? Well, why then? I have to explain. The goal is simply testing ideas. We want to find out this crucial question. Are we building the right thing? Or is the thing really of service or not? And we want to find that out cheap and fast. They are unlikely friends, Spring and Lambda. But here's why I think I'm not totally crazy. One, it's extremely cheap to develop. The costs of hiring and upskilling are huge. And you're not going to be able to convince your bosses to start building prototypes if you're going to actually have to hire new people to do this, or send people to training, or upskill. You probably already have dev talent who know Java and have done Spring forever. It's kind of old. And there's a huge Spring talent pool out there. That's one of the most commonly used frameworks in enterprise. Two, it's cheap to deploy this stack. With AWS Lambda, I mean, you pay for what you use, obviously. The number of Lambda requests uh, versus cost per month here, you can see. If you're using maybe 4 million, OK, maybe 30 bucks a month. But most of these prototypes, you're using, I mean, less than 10,000 requests per month. So the cost is trivial. Um, I should say this is with a request time 400 milliseconds and memory of 1.5 gig, which I think is pretty generous for Spring Boot. Um, and you're worried about the runaway costs, more function invocations coming in. Well, gateway usage plans. We can easily limit the requ requests per second and the simultaneous requests with the burst limit here. So DynamoDB. Why DynamoDB? Kind of a weird choice, again, for Spring. Well, if we're spinning up these prototypes, it's not going to be one prototype like we might have one app. You might spin up five in a week, end up with 50. And the cost of continually deploying, this is the second smallest Postgres database you could deploy on RDS, the T4G small, so two gigabytes. And still, you can see the cost. It doesn't compare to even 4 million writes and reads per month. Need backups? Try 20 cents per gigabyte per month with, Lam uh, with DynamoDB. So when costs are low, it's easy to justify taking a risk. That was Ed Kapmo again from Pixar. That's the point. Cheap development and cheap to deploy. Number three, it's fast to develop. Spring has a lot of problems. I know people have issue with it these days. But it is written for fast development. You can't really hold that against it. All the auto config, all the magic, it's built for that. You end up with pretty maintainable and readable code. Pivotal, now VMware Tanzu Labs use it all over the world with their clients for this exact reason, which is solving business problems quickly. It's extremely mature and active. We all know that. It's not going to disappear on you next year. There are the endless guides and Stack Overflow answers. What you're trying to do has probably been done before, which means less time testing, uh, less time coding and debugging, and more time testing ideas, which is the entire point. Four. It's fast to deploy. That I'll show you now. So deploying Spring Boot web apps on Lambda. We've got three main ways. The AWS serverless Java container. This is a library by Amazon themselves. Um, doesn't support just Spring, but JVM frameworks in general. So you can see Jersey, Spark, Micronaut there. 
Um, and there are five steps to taking your Spring Boot app to being deployed on Lambda. First, add the dependency. Two, add the Lambda handler. It's just a piece of boilerplate. Um, exclude the Tomcat server, because you're not going to need that on Lambda, obviously. Four, adding your Terraform config. Again, this is pretty boilerplate, but it's just a, a SAM deployment file. So if you're familiar with them, they're extremely extendable and configurable. You could do a lot of stuff with them. And deploy. We use the SAM CLI client from Amazon, uh, made for serverless, to simply build and deploy. Now we've got our function deployed on Lambda. Um, we've got a gateway which has been created with our URL you can see here. Um, so that's pretty fast. If the goal is cheap and fast, I mean, we can develop in Spring just like normal and forget the underlying infrastructure of what we're actually hosted on. And we can do things like blue-green or canary deployments um, with that SAM deployment file. Pretty easy to add a pre-traffic hook, so your new version of your Lambda is going to be spun up. The pre-traffic hook runs. This is where you could run your E2E tests or whatever. And if they pass, then traffic is switched to your new version. But we do still have cold starts. It's quick and simple. Um, the next one is by JetBrains, a little library combining Kotlin and serverless. And that is called Kotlus. They support three DSLs. That's Spring Boot itself, but also Ktor. And then Kotlus have their own DSL with some of their own annotations and things. And once again, there are five steps from Spring Boot to deployed on Lambda. First, set up the Kotlus plugin. Again, this is just a copy-paste job. Um, apply the plugin, add the dependency, and implement the Kotlus class. And now you've got a Gradle task you can use to deploy. Um, this is your output. So you'll see 16 resources added, however many it is. And your up functions on Lambda. And this one's a bit different because uh, the API gateway protocol is REST, not HTTP. So it's a bit more expensive, but then you can see exactly what endpoints you've got deployed. And if you wanted, you could manually test them in the UI. I mean, you're probably using something like Swagger, so probably not needed, but um, if you like. Another great benefit uh, with Kotlus is you can just easily spin up a local environment for testing or running on your machine. Again, there's a Gradle task local, and you can use this config in your build Gradle, use AWS simulation. And if you're running Docker locally, you'll spin up your own um, AWS, yep, it's right there, emulation of what's going to really be deployed. And for those cold starts, finally, we have a kind of solution. They have a configurable auto warm. So by default, your Lambda will be warmed every five minutes. So um, most apps won't go cold in that time. I've done some testing and found it never to go cold in five minutes. But you can also configure that to however long you want. So essentially, your Lambda will be started up every three minutes or however often you want so that users don't face those cold starts. So probably no cold starts for a very small cost. Those requests add up to basically nothing because they're so quick to Lambda. Um, and with Kotlus as well, another great benefit, you can use your spring schedulers just like normal with the scheduled annotation. The downside is Kotlus is still pretty new. It's on version 0.2.0, .0, so not very mature. Um, still in active development, but I think the team isn't huge in JetBrains. But I find Kotlus to be a great option. Again, it's cheap and fast unless you get something out there that you can provide to users or whatever you're doing. Consume new data through your service, integrate multiple APIs, whatever you want to do. So that's two spring options. But you're probably thinking serverless and JVM. Does this guy even know what Growl VM is? And yes, I do. I'm not a spring fanboy. Um, for example, I've been using Quarkus since really before I got into Spring, back at the end of 2019. Um, 
And I will always love those boot times when you have Spring Boot in 9.6 seconds from one of my tests and the migrated native app in 0.1. So I've seen the benefits firsthand in a company and personal projects. I mean, if you want those boot times and they're critical for you, like say you're on Kubernetes or you want to spin those pods up instantly, great. It's all reactive, it's new, it's Red Hat, who doesn't love that Fedora? And you can also easily deploy it to Lambda. Of course, Quarkus has its own Lambda extension. And that's why number three is Quarkus. But I thought you said Spring. Yeah, let me explain. We have the Quarkus extension for Spring Web, a for Spring Web API, Quarkus for Spring Dependency Injection API, Quarkus for Spring Security API, and we even have an entire Red Hat application migration toolkit, a full-on app, where you can import a Spring Boot application, and it'll tell you exactly what um, configuration and annotations you need to change to turn Spring Boot app into a Quarkus one. I think you see where this is going. It's not that hard to turn a Spring Boot app into a Quarkus one. And migrations suck, I can attest to that. I've been through going from a self-hosted platform to AWS or Jenkins to GitLab, and it's painful and you feel like you're wasting your time. But in this case, it's not that bad. I've done them in work and at home, depending on how complex your app is. It could take you a day, it could take a week or two. Um, this guy, apparently, it took him five minutes. But we're trying to find out if something is even worth building. We don't know if what we're building is of service or not. Coming back to that critical question. So I choose to start with Spring, with Quarkus as a great exit ramp. Start with Spring, and Quarkus is always there as an option if you change your mind later. Quarkus has done such a good job of making it that easy that to me, even though I really love Quarkus, Starting with it feels a bit like a premature optimization if you don't need it. And that's because the goal is testing ideas or testing technology and doing that for cheap and fast. So it's not about the fast boot times or the cool tech, even though those things are great. Spring helps you to move fast early and answer those questions. So why not Quarkus? Or I'm lumping Spring Native in here um, even more immature than Quarkus, obviously, but why is it not so fast, in my opinion? 99% of the time, developing with these GraalVM apps that build to native images are great, but the 1% of the time is killer, and that's where you're losing your time because it's less mature, there's less documentation to copy off, and time spent debugging is time spent not testing ideas. So it's exactly what we don't want is spending our time debugging or looking at workarounds for normal code solutions because of our choice of framework. And native builds have different needs. Normally, you can pretty easily find what you want to do online, copy it, make some changes, but maybe when you're using GraalVM, you find out, oh, I need to register that for reflection, or I need to initialize this class at runtime. These things seem small, but all up, they really get in your way and block the main goal, because all we want to do is to test something. So what about down the line? You've had your app for a while, and now it's really just a production service, not a prototype. Well, for one, um, yeah, if you can't reach the cold starts, we've already talked about the easy migration to Quarkus or an alternative. So you're pretty safe there. If you're sick of DynamoDB and you want to go classic with a relational database, well, there's the data migration and the code change is really not big. This is your DynamoDB table typically in a Java app and it really just looks like a normal relational entity mapping. You can change the profile and financials. That will really just be a foreign key relationship um, instead of one row and then it's really trivial. 
Uh, maybe for you, Lambda was cute for prototyping, but you want something else. Or your team's already got a Kubernetes cluster, or you just want to go bare bones, JVM, Mabel, maybe. Well, we all know it's super easy to turn one of these apps into an image. Um, a Docker file can be seriously that short. And if you want to go Kubernetes, I'm not saying this is a perfect deployment YAML file, but it's seriously easy to go from um, that basic Docker image to getting it onto Kubernetes. So my point is, you're not locked in to anything. By starting with Spring, Lambda, DynamoDB, if you want to go for it, the choice is yours. Even though it can always turn into a production service in the future, it is just a prototype. Go with the tech that helps you move fast, because you might just be throwing this thing away anyway. You can always migrate later. And let's look back at those spring downsides from the start. Number one, cold starts. Well, it might not even matter for you. Maybe your prototype is for an in-house demo with your team. I mean, you can warm that up beforehand. Or you've got customers coming in for testing. You can warm that up beforehand. Remember, you're saving cost here by having those instances never started up. But if it is, again, we can do that warming ping from Kotlas. It's the um, baked in. But if we want to use the AWS serverless Java container, very easy to just ping your own endpoint as well every five minutes if that's what you want to go for. It's not 100%, but it's pretty good. Or again, just migrate to GraalVM. You've got the instant startups, and you're good. Two, the duplication of responsibilities. Well, we've seen we don't have to write any of that code in, uh, specifically for Lambda or for API Gateway, mapping this stuff into your functions. We're totally covered by both of the libraries, or all three of the libraries, if you're counting Quarkus. The impact on downstream services. Well, DynamoDB is not affected, obviously. Um, but Say you want to go for the relational database and can't handle more than 60 concurrent connections. Well, we saw already we can set a burst limit, so we're never going to have more than 50 or more than 30 concurrent functions running. Um, and the last downside, which is that it's spring. It's not cool. But maybe he's not so bad, depending on what you're doing. It's opinionated, and it does a lot of magic. But if it helps you get something done cheap and fast, then maybe that's worth it. I have one more thought, but I'll open it up to questions now. In one of your slides, there was a sentence that you develop local your application in Spring. You can develop as usual mm -hmm. in local environment. So what do you mean, uh, develop as usual? Because for me, Develop as usual means that I have a Spring Boot application which has Tomcat web starter, mm -hmm. and I start the application as a Java process on my laptop, mm -hmm. and then hit them and uh, observe the results. So what means the uh, local development in uh, that way? Yeah, I mean, you can still do that, obviously. Um, this is just one small difference. It's really an enhancement with Kotlas, where they provide this AWS emulation. So they're starting up a mini proxy, which is functioning as what API Gateway will be, and it's going to be exactly the same setup. So I usually use that if I'm using Kotlas, just in case there is some bug or some wrinkle with the setup. But otherwise, yeah, I would just start it, like you said. I mean, do you start Java process in your ID? In IntelliJ? Uh, yeah, you can, or command line. Is that what you mean? Yes, I, I wanted to know what, what exactly mean uh, simulate a VUS environment, what, what ah, it changes. OK, so you just run that Gradle task, right, that comes with Kotlas. You don't have to start up your Spring Boot app then. It's starting up the equivalent of what will be the Lambda functions and the API gateway, which maps to them. OK. Does that make sense? I think I will need to see an example. So OK. We can talk later if you too like. Too general. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. For the talk. OK, thanks. Anyone else? One more uh, from my side. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
for the cases where you need to integrate with someone, I get it. But if you're going to, I don't know, the shop mall and sitting with your laptop, why not just run it on Docker in whatever way, with whatever Spring version you want? Yeah, totally. I guess then your issue is, I mean, you're not actually um, in that situation. They were using an app, so they're not actually showing... Um, you mean running it just locally, right? Yeah. Maybe. If you want to go cheap and dirty and mm -hmm. fast, th th that's why I'm thinking. And then you can ship your container if you need to integrate with someone. So you're avoiding the additional layer of complexity with the serverless. Yeah, totally possible. I guess the idea is that it's available to the public. So in this case, you can hand it to someone or give them a link online which they can click on. Um, or you can just as easily send it out in an email list, that kind of thing. So, so you're optimizing also on the cost of the EC2, for example, instead of shipping the Docker, you just run it on Lambda. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. OK, thank you. Cool. Other Anyone questions? Else? OK, I will wrap up. So my key point is everyone needs to test their ideas. And that goes for 14-year-olds trying to sell soft drink or the biggest companies in the world. We need to test, learn, test, learn, test, learn, and reduce these feedback loops. And it doesn't have to be Spring. It doesn't have to be Lambda, like we just talked about. It doesn't have to be even AWS. Um, however you do it, the important part is bringing engineers in early, building the ownership, finding out what's feasible and what's not, and testing your ideas for cheap and fast. Thank you.